Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Juta Kunz. Uh, she will uh, talk about scalarized compact object in alternative theories of gravity. Yes, uh, thank you very much sir, for the invitation uh, to this conference. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be here. I was also very happy to listen to the talk of uh, Sir Yen, our former uh, student. And uh, in this talk, I uh, would like to speak about some um, yeah, various types, let's say, of compact objects uh, in uh, a certain set of uh, alternative theories of gravity. And um, here I will first focus on Einstein's scalar gauss bonnet theories. And uh, there we have really uh, a very interesting number of very different types of uh, objects, uh, namely black holes, warm holes, and particle like uh, exotic compact objects, which can also be ultra compact objects. And then uh, I will go over to uh, a theory that is uh, uh, better motivated from cosmology. Uh, uh, there so far we have only constructed uh, black holes, but I'm pretty sure uh, the whole set of other uh, solutions should also be there. So um, <clears throat> let me start. Uh, we we uh, have many reasons, really profound reasons to go beyond uh, general relativity. Of course, we always want uh, our solar system physics to be uh, very well described by general relativity. So we want this type of um, yeah, limit. But uh, now going beyond general relativity, we would like to have some um, guides. And uh, we, we currently don't know what the real theory should be. The, the theory of uh, quantum gravity, but we can imagine that there might be some low energy effective theory. and. Uh, Currently, we are basically studying such types of low energy effective theories. And one, uh, I would say, well motivated such theory uh, is when we take uh, general relativity and uh, we add a scalar field that is coupled to the Gauss Bonnet higher curvature term. So here you see the Gauss Bonnet term. Uh, so we are quadratic in curvature. And uh, this type of theory arises from string theory uh, in the low energy limit. However, in that case, it comes with a certain coupling function uh, f of phi and the scalar field phi, this is a dilaton. Now these uh, theories are very nice because they lead to a uh, second order field equations uh, uh, and uh, there are no ghosts, uh, no also Kasky instability. So, uh, they are well behaved and uh, yeah, interesting to study and they belong to this type of uh, Hondeski uh, theories that were studied uh, long ago. Now, when you look at the field equations, um, we get a set of, of course, now generalized uh, Einstein equations and I've uh, written it here in the usual way that we have the Einstein tensor on the one side and then we have the matter, so let's say matter, the, the scalar field it can be some gravitational scalar field, of course, on the other side. But also when you write it this way, we see we get uh, now from this gauss bonnet term, uh, here uh, another piece uh, on the right-hand side. And this is the most interesting piece for the talk and for the types of solutions that exist. Namely, uh, this let's, Call it so we now have some in total um, effective uh, energy uh, momentum stress energy tensor uh, and this effective uh, stress energy tensor this uh, can give rise to negative energy densities and uh, so we would violate uh, the energy conditions just um, gravitationally from this piece here yeah. the, the scalar field is fine so um, this allows us to obtain warm holes uh, then just because um, we have this 
negative contributions from gravity itself, from this generalized gravity. Now, for the main part of the talk, we are going to look at the scalar equation. So here we have the scalar equation. And uh, you see, um, we, we get something like a Klein-Gordon equation. However, here we have this contribution from uh, the Gauss-Bonnet piece. And uh, the coupling function, uh, uh, it's derivative enters. And now, what type of solutions we get and what their properties are depends very strongly on the choice of coupling functions on this f of phi. So when we go to string theory, so we take the dilatonic coupling, then our general relativistic black hole solutions, they do not remain solutions. And we only find solutions that have a scalar field for black holes. So we have only hairy black holes. On the other hand, if um, we choose uh, this coupling function differently, then we can have uh, the solutions of general relativity also as solutions. So they are retained as solutions. We retain the Schwarzschild and the Kerr black hole, but we get in addition uh, new types of uh, black holes, uh, namely those that also carry uh, a scalar field. So, and we say they are spontaneously scalarized. And because this scalarization arises because of this uh, Gauss-Bonnet piece, which is a curvature piece, we say it's a uh, curvature induced uh, spontaneous scalarization. So, uh, these are the two types of black holes um, that we would have. And I will now <clears throat> start with the black holes in the first uh, theory. And uh, these have been studied long ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> we see in the 90s, uh, Yuta Kanti and collaborators found the first ones. And here we have this dilatonic coupling function. Now, when one takes such a dilatonic coupling functions, one only gets scalarized black holes, no Schwarzschild black holes. And here we see the horizon radius uh, uh, and we have scaled it by the coupling constant. And here we have the mass and scaled yeah. it by the coupling constant. And uh, the studded line is the Schwarzschild black hole. And now the scalarized black holes, they are, and it's the static ones, of course, they are here given. And you see, when we go to very large masses and uh, very large horizons, then uh, we kind of approach Schwarzschild. But uh, the interesting thing is happening down here. <clears throat> here, the solutions stop. So we don't have any solutions anymore below a certain mass and below a certain horizon radius. And the reason is just uh, a theoretical one. When, uh, when one looks at the horizon expansion, <clears throat> then one finds a square root. And it just so happens that the radicand vanishes right here. So we don't get a <laughs> a real scalar field, the, the scalar field would be imaginary. So uh, we don't get a real solution anymore. So we, we get a theoretical uh, lower bound, let's say on the mass <laughs> for a given coupling constant. And uh, here you see very nicely um, that uh, the energy density of these uh, hairy black holes can be negative. You see here this curve, this is, uh, uh, the time time component of the stress energy tensor. And um, so if this is positive, then the energy density is negative. And uh, this is kind of the reason we uh, violate uh, the no hair theorem, but it's also what's going to happen later with this other type of solutions. Um, one can rotate. So here, this would be the curve solution and here we would have um, the Schwarzschild solution in the corner. Uh, it's the area that we plot versus um, the angular momentum. So these are the static black holes. And here you see the area. Uh, this is the whole domain of existence. Um, the area of these uh, uh, dilatonic or scalarized black holes is smaller 
However, when we look at their, oh, I don't have the slide figure here. But when you look at the, uh, the entropy, the entropy is larger. So, yeah. Uh, we can, of course, study stability and we should look, uh, let's say, linear stability. We should look at all the modes uh, that one can have. Uh, we have even parity, R parity modes. Uh, and uh, the simplest are, of course, the Rayleigh modes that one always studies in the beginning, which belong to the polar modes. And um, by studying these modes, one learns about uh, stability, but one also learns about ring down uh, of uh, you know, some, some excited uh, black hole or possibly after some uh, collisions and merger. And uh, when one compares to Schwarzschild, here we have the comparison. Uh, and we have just normalized with respect to uh, Schwarzschild. Then we see here, this is the coupling constant again, um, this theta, uh, and this is the frequency. Here we have uh, the imaginary part, uh, the, the damping, and then we see um, no instability so far here. Uh, however, uh, the deviation of the modes is only small. So it's almost right to, to concerning the actual modes. Um, uh, now also for the polar modes, so when we look at the gravitational modes, however, we do have a scalar field. So we have more modes. Uh, we also have uh, modes uh, kind of led by the scalar field for uh, the quadrupole, but there's also a dipole and a monopole. And it's the dipole radiation, which puts very strong bounds on this uh, type of theory, because yeah, uh, in a binary system, one would have uh, dipole radiation. So um, these dilatonic couplings are not that favorite anymore because of observations. And one has thought of kind of evading this constraint. And uh, this brings us now to the uh, curvature induced to uh, scalarize black hole. So we just uh, take a different coupling function. So we don't take the dilatonic coupling one, but just some scalar coupling function that satisfies these two conditions. Uh, the derivative of the scalar field with respect to the scalar field uh, uh, vanishes. Uh, and uh, when it vanishes, when um, the scalar field itself vanishes, and this is, of course, what we want. Uh, we want the GR limit. And in the GR limit, we don't have a scalar field. So um, this is uh, yeah, kind of a, a physical condition uh, that we would like to have. So we want to have the structured and the first solutions as solutions. So we would like to have a vanishing scalar field. And we don't observe a scalar field in cosmology. And I'll come back to that later. So uh, now when we satisfy these conditions, uh, we retain all the solutions of general relativity. However, we can get new solutions and this is because of a tachyonic instability. So you see, um, this looks like the Klein-Gordon equation. So we can identify some effective mass in here. And uh, when we uh, write it down, um, then, yeah, we, we see it's this gauss bonnet piece that enters here. And the gauss bonnet piece, when we have a, let's say, Schwarzschild black hole as the background, um, yeah, th th this will give us some contribution. And so at some point, uh, we can just have a sufficiently strong um, curvature so that uh, this uh, tachyonic instability arises and we get a new branch of black holes. So here um, you see how these, um, the set of solutions looks like for two well-studied theories. So we have two coupling constants, uh, coupling functions, which uh, satisfy our conditions. So this is um, the first one that was uh, really nice because it led to stable solutions. And this uh, is just the quadratic ones, the simplest one that one can choose um, to obtain this phenomenon. 
of uh, spontaneous scalarization. However, this one, the quadratic one for static black holes, um, it, it does lead to unstable black holes. So here for, let's say for, uh, start with this one, uh, where we have a more complicated uh, uh, behavior depends on phi, and it's basically the higher order terms in phi. But, uh, that we do have the uh, stable uh, black holes. Uh, so let's look at um, the domain of existence of these scalarized black holes. And here we have the uh, horizon radius. Uh, we have just uh, taking a fixed value for the coupling constant. And here we have the scalar field at the horizon. And then you see uh, this blue region, the yellow region, and these black curves. And the interesting thing, so the black holes are the black curves, just uh, these black curves here, this, uh, you see n equals zero. So the fundamental, the first uh, solution, first scalarized solutions that we get. And then here, uh, higher, uh, so really excited uh, with the nodes, n one node, two nodes, and more nodes. And what you should see is uh, kind of look at the curvature here of this uh, curve. It's bending down, yeah. So it's bending down, and um, this is going to tell us we will have stability. So here it's bending up. So really, once uh, will be uh, unstable. But yeah, this is what one expects, of course. Uh, uh, they are excited, but here we should have something stable. And here you see it, it's bending just like uh, uh, the excited ones. So this is unstable. And you also see this uh, kind of uh, heuristically already, what is stable, what is unstable by looking at the entropy. So you can make an entropic argument, say, oh, this is entropically favored. But of course, finally, one has to make a linear stability analysis to at least to confirm that what you thought should be stable really is uh, uh, stable. So here you have the uh, stability analysis. And uh, now the, this plot is in terms not of horizon quantities, but in terms of global quantities. So we have the, the scalar charge here and uh, the mass. No scalar charge, this is Rothschild, of course. And uh, here, uh, at a certain value of the mass for a fixed coupling points, we see a branch of scalarized uh, solutions arises. And the theory is symmetric in phi. So of course, we also have a branch on here. Um, this means now Schwarzschild is unstable. Schwarzschild has its first unstable mode right here. We have zero mode and then unstable mode. And this is what you see here. This is the first unstable mode of Schwarzschild. So Schwarzschild is no longer stable, but we have a stable scalarized black hole and it's stable up to this point here. Right at this point, uh, when we look at our mode equations, um, we run into a problem, namely um, we lose hyperbolicity of the equations and our formalism breaks down. So, but up to here, there's no unstable mode. And uh, yeah, we have uh, seen this by making the full stability analysis uh, linearly. And for the, the other, uh, the excited, the really excited ones you see, Every time there's a new radio excitation, the Schwarzschild has a new unstable mode. And uh, the, the unstable modes uh, of these uh, really excited uh, black holes, they match very nicely those of uh, Schwarzschild when they start. So this just uh, uh, yeah, showing some polar modes, but, and again, we lose, uh, I mean, for the, these higher um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, stability 
analysis uh, calculations, we have this hyperbolicity that we lose. Um, but okay, um, it, it doesn't change much. It's, it's very close uh, to uh, the one of the value uh, modes that we studied first. So we know uh, for this theory, we have some, a set of stable uh, solutions on the fundamental branch. But when you do the same thing for just the flat square theory, no. Um, everything is unstable in the static case. Now let's look at rotation. Rotation um, gives uh, some interesting new perspectives here. Uh, here, this A is the usual A of the curve solution. So here we have the annual momentum entering, and you see in the gauss bonnet uh, piece, now this angular momentum enters, and you see it enters with different signs. Uh, so when we retain the same sign for the coupling constant, then you see these minus signs occur. So we can imagine, okay, uh, this spin that we put with the press, scalarization, but it could also happen, and this was suggested by Dima and collaborators, it could also happen that uh, the, the minus uh, is now the most important if there is sufficiently strong rotation. And in such a case, we uh, say there is spin-induced uh, scalarization, and this really happens. Um, these are just some examples. You see, um, these are now for the positive sign. So down here we have this branch, uh, this long branch up to here, somewhere we know, um, okay, it's stable of the fundamental scalarized black holes. And now we can add angular momentum, but you see as we increase angular momentum, uh, the domain gets smaller. And here you see the same thing. It's the area now that is shown versus uh, the angular momentum. As we increase angular momentum, um, the, uh, yeah, the domain gets smaller, but the area can also, the area of the horizon can also um, increase, uh, decrease uh, a lot. Uh, so um, this might be uh, very interesting. And uh, Kunya and collaborators, the Portuguese group, has studied the shadow uh, and the effects for the shadow in that case and compared to M87. Um, this is now the other case, the other sign. And if we put the other sign, uh, yeah, you see, we have to go beyond a minimal value of the angular momentum. This is now again scaled uh, with, a, uh, with the mass squared. So, um, this angular momentum goes from zero to one for curve. Uh, so we have to go above point, point 0.5 in order to get uh, this uh, scalarization. But we do get it. And this is, uh, again, from the Portuguese group. They have used uh, this coupling. But we know we do have a stable static black holes. So um, it's no surprise. Uh, we also have and tropically preferred um, uh, rotating black holes. However, we used uh, the other coupling, where we know for the phi square, there are no stable scalarized black holes. They are all unstable when we have the positive uh, coupling. Now, when we go to the negative coupling, interestingly, we also get entropically uh, favored um, <clears throat> rotating black holes. So let me now come to some of the other objects. And here we have um, wormholes. And uh, <clears throat> then we'll look at uh, the, the particle-like solution. So wormholes are kind of motivated. They could exist because we can violate the energy conditions. And uh, so we have a throat, at least. Uh, no singularity, we would like to have traversable wormholes. And uh, actually we have <clears throat> first done our studies uh, with ordinary wormhole coordinates, I would say. And then in order to understand a particular point, we have switched to uh, isotropic uh, wormhole coordinates. 
So you see here this H always contains a constant in front of this uh, angular piece, which then tells us, yeah, we cannot kind of shrink uh, to zero uh, our uh, certain points. Now this is uh, then what one finds um, instead of a single line, we find uh, now kind of a, a two parameter space. So the domain of existence, uh, let's say for a dilatonic coupling again, would look like this. So here these crosses are the black holes. Here on the right hand side, we run into singularity. So we have no further solutions. And then our point was uh, these dots, these black dots. We didn't understand these black dots, what was happening here uh, in the beginning. And uh, <clears throat> once we uh, use different uh, coordinates, uh, yeah, uh, coordinates are so important as you all know, uh, we uh, finally understood what's happening. So right here, the throat becomes degenerate. And um, instead of having only wormholes with a single throat, we develop an equator with a, as a throat. So it's um, a different type of wormhole that continues here. Um, now, in order to obtain the solutions and have solutions that says no singularity in the whole domain, so from plus infinity to the throat to minus infinity, um, we, uh, we have to kind of uh, cut our solutions. They, they do have a, a nice throat. So this develops just uh, in these theories. But then when we go beyond the throat, somewhere in the other part uh, of the universe or in the second universe, uh, some singularity uh, yeah, develops. And we would like to not have this. And so what we do is we kind of take the throat and then, um, yeah, we um, reflect at the throat. So we have a, a reflected uh, solution. It's the same solution on both sides. Uh, however, because of this reflection, we have to be sure that we kind of uh, have a good solution. So we have to look at junction conditions and solve the uh, uh, junction conditions. Uh, uh, but we can do that with ordinary matter. So this is fine. We, we don't need some strange uh, uh, type of matter. And uh, now when we have an equator also, then you see we have a throat, then the equator arises and the singularity appears behind. So we can also cut here and uh, then we reflect and have a symmetric solution. Again, we have to be sure that uh, everything is fine and uh, uh, we have to satisfy the function. This is how an embedding of such a wormhole looks like. Uh, an equator, two throats, one on each side. And uh, then one can, of course, uh, wonder what types of motion are possible, study um, geodesics and look at the effective potential. And if one does that, uh, one finds now, and this is very different from what we know from Ellis uh, wormholes, that we do have bound states. So uh, we have. Uh, uh, let's say two types of bound states uh, here you see nicely uh, on um, yeah this embedding that we have bound states where um, uh, this orbit always changes sides it just always keeps going from one universe to the other and back but you also have bound states uh, just in one universe um, <clears throat> Interesting is, of course, um, would such a wormhole be traversable? Would it really be a uh, yeah, path for uh, some observer? And then, yeah, it depends uh, what one puts for the coupling constants or for yeah, uh, this, the size of this wormhole. So when we just say, okay, let's take the values from string theory we arrive at, astronomical numbers uh, really for uh, the acceleration that uh, an observer would feel 
So 10 to the on the order 50 times uh, uh, the acceleration on Earth. This is deadly. So um, yeah, um, this is not what we would like. Uh, we would like to have a nice acceleration when passing this wormhole. So let's uh, ask for this one G, but then we have to have an astronomical size uh, for this type of wormhole. So um, it has to be on the order of light years, uh, the size of the road. So yeah. And concerning stability, this has not yet been fully uh, established. Uh, um, there is some first works from us uh, and then some uh, more recent uh, works from uh, Kuyvamba, Kanapia, uh, Zidenko. And uh, yeah, they, they took the most uh, general, or more general type of um, uh, perturbations and um, but only look at some some small space of the domain of existence. So um, we don't know yet. They, there might be some, but possibly there are none. But in, in any case, uh, they they would be too huge for us. One can of course use all kinds of um, other coupling functions, not the diatonic ones. When uh, then has problems. Uh, um, if one does so, no, no problems because one um, always uh, just violates by by this uh, effective energy tensor uh, that is gravitational. Here are the null and the weak energy conditions, and one can look at how uh, the domain of existence looks like. Um, but uh, let me now come to this other interesting type of uh, objects that we also have. And uh, this type of uh, object, uh, this is, let's say, particle-like. It's, it's a bit like uh, what Wheeler wanted. It's not yet perfect, I would say, uh, but it's uh, kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a just regular uh, space-time configuration. Uh, so, the metric is globally regular. The stress energy tensor is everywhere regular. So the only little point is that it's it has a diverging scalar field at the origin. But this divergence does not affect uh, the metric, the energy tensor. Uh, it's a bit reminiscent of, let's say, Coulomb potential, right? They also have the divergence at the origin. So, um, <clears throat> Let's look at uh, this funny uh, type of solutions that also exists. And we ran into it uh, when we were uh, looking at the types of solutions uh, of the wormholes uh, that we might have. And uh, see here, we have uh, the wormholes. Uh, here we have some uh, yeah, scaled uh, coupling constant. Here we have the scaled uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we started with the dilaton, so this is why it's the uh, dilatonic, so scalar charge. And um, right here in this part of the domain of existence, we, we have the particle like solutions. So the black line, uh, these are the black holes, and these are the wormholes, and here we have particle like solutions. And uh, you see this uh, little red line, this means when we are below. We have uh, not only uh, exotic compact objects, ECOs, but we have UCOs, uh, um, so ultra compact objects, because in this region here, uh, they do possess light rings. So um, they, they could also mimic, uh, in some sense, um, uh, other compact objects like the colors. So this is a. Uh, now, not the dilatonic, but the phi square coupling constant. And we have uh, played around with coupling functions. Um, uh, and you see here we have some overlap of particle like solutions and uh, uh, those um, that have, yeah, can uh, describe wormholes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, you see, we also have some particle like solutions that possess a throat and an equator. So here you see some embeddings uh, of 
how some of these uh, solutions look like. And when you see here, this looks like yeah, um, there is um, a throat an equator, and then we are coming to the origin. So um, funny type of objects. And this is just uh, kind of illustrating for one particular case. Uh, now we have taken a polynomial in the phi squared. Um, that everything is well behaved at the origin, uh, except for the scalar field, which diverges. But uh, the metric is perfect. The uh, energy density, uh, so the stress energy tensor is perfect. So one can just do all these things analytically by expansions. And now when we look at how, yeah, how is this energy distributed there, now, it depends very strongly on where we are in configuration space or in the domain, sorry, domain of existence. But uh, the most interesting ones when you come to these ultra compact objects, uh, for them, the uh, energy density has a very strong peak uh, somewhere where you'd say, oh, for a black hole of that mass, this would be roughly where uh, the horizon is located. So you see these peaks here. Uh, and um, so it looks like we have kind of a bag. We have a bag, um, some negative energy density in this bag. And then uh, we have uh, the bag wall and uh, the outside. <clears throat> and here uh, on the other side, uh, you see just how the mass function increases. Uh, also illustrating again how strongly now the, the energy contributes uh, at a uh, peak, let's say, uh, at, at the uh, surface of this uh, bag. Um, <clears throat> now, when we look at uh, possible observation effects, so then we would say we uh, look at yeah, the light rings. And uh, the light rings, uh, now we have a, a regular object. so. It's very different from a black hole in the sense that it should have, if it has an unstable light ring, uh, a maximum, it should also have a minimum, a stable light ring. Um, I mean, this has been proven for general relativity, but it seems to hold it quite generally. So in this uh, theory, we, we just uh, observed this. If there is a maximum here in the effect potential of the uh, <coughs> photons, then there's also somewhere a minimum. And uh, whenever we have light rings, we would say the object qualifies as an ultra compact object. Uh, we can also look at uh, the effect potential for particles. And for particles, uh, then uh, we have, uh, yeah, uh, for these ultra compact objects, uh, also the possibility that kind of in the back, yes. Uh, in the back, there might be some particle bound um, that might be uh, moving there. Uh, and very interesting also is, uh, of course, uh, the echoes. Um, we have a regular object, so we expect that there should be echoes. So when we look at some, some test field, then this is really what we observe. So here um, on the right-hand side, we have the effective uh, potential for some test field to see, uh, uh, and, and this set is just uh, for one parameter, and this is for another parameter, one type of solution, another type of solution. So let's just uh, focus at one, and when we go far away, well, <clears throat> at, at some point, uh, of course, we are very much like the Schwarzschild, but uh, we are very much like Schwarzschild in much more uh, of the space here. So this looks all very much like Schwarzschild, uh, only when we uh, come close to the horizon, then <clears throat> we deviate, of course, very much, strongly. Uh, at the horizon, a wave is just being absorbed. But now we have this regular particle type of solution. So we have this uh, uh, repulsive potential yeah, from the uh, uh, <clears throat> angular momentum. So 
when we now have uh, uh, some some wave, something coming, then we have uh, yeah okay we have uh, this uh, reflection. But uh, reflection is only in part, and in part we continue. But then here, instead of uh, being fully absorbed to whatever passed the barrier by the black hole, this is being uh, fully reflected backwards. And so we come here and then yeah, we partly transmitted, partly reflected again, and so on, and so on. And, and this is how we get all these echoes. So we observe echoes. <clears throat> and um, now, uh, coming now <clears throat> to the last part of the talk, this is very new. Um, and uh, now, the, the point is that we typically for GR, we want uh, the scalar field to vanish. And uh, <clears throat> so when we want to have spontaneous polarization, we would like to have a vanishing scalar field and we would, this means we should have a cosmologically vanishing scalar field. So at infinity, far away from the object, uh, the scalar field should go to zero. But if one looks at this type of theory and um, just uh, looks at how such a theory would evolve, how a scalar field would evolve in the early cosmology, then one sees that hmm, it's, it's not natural that the scalar field would vanish when we have a gauss bonnet term. The, usually, unless we do some very strong fine tuning, we would have some scalar field. But we, we don't want the scalar field because if we have the scalar field, we might run into observation problems. So no scalar field. And uh, it should happen naturally that there is no scalar field in the evolution of the cosmos. And this uh, was uh, done by the group in Nottingham. So they said, let's just take uh, our old Lagrangian and to uh, add a, a Ritchie coupling, just uh, with the same coupling function. <clears throat> a look and uh, then let's evolve uh, the scalar field in <clears throat> uh, uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, space time, just uh, <clears throat> usual space time, and see how now the Ritchie scalar and the Gauss Burnett piece. Uh, uh, in this background effect, this scalar field. And uh, this is what they found. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, this is the radiation dominated era, um, big bang nuclear th synthesis, now meta dominated and cosmological constant uh, or dark energy dominated. <clears throat> and then you see, you start with some value of the scalar field, but you don't want uh, from the beginning <clears throat> the cosmos to be scalar dominated. Yeah? So you say there is a scalar field, but it's not dominating the evolution of the cosmos, but then uh, let's evolve. And then you see <clears throat> here in the matter dominated uh, era, the scalar field just uh, goes to zero. And then it's gone and um, this is nice. <clears throat> so if one adds such a piece, one does not have all these uh, problems from yeah, arising from a, the presence of a scalar field that one might have, and then one can look at the holes. And this is what this group also did. So <clears throat> they studied uh, what is now the effect on the black holes. And uh, it just has another nice effect. As you see here, um, if you take uh, sufficiently large values of this coupling constant, you see the bending goes to the other side, even if you have only a five square coupling. So the black holes are stable, that they should be. Um, just from the bending, from the entropy, when we uh, conclude so. And uh, this group also made a stability analysis showing nicely that there is this range uh, here, blue, uh, where the solutions are stable and only beyond that they are unstable. And the last thing that we did uh, now was think uh, our previous solutions um, 
they should also exist in this type of cosmologically motivated model, which is really nice. And uh, so we started with the rotating black holes, and these are some preliminary results for the rotating black holes. And as expected, as expected, when we look at the entropy, uh, the solutions are entropically favored. So we would say here for this large coupling constant, yeah, they probably should be stable, but of course, a uh, linear stability analysis for rapidly rotating black holes um, <clears throat> in this type of theory, this is quite something. And uh, uh, we have not yet. Uh, ventured into this. So uh, let me now conclude. You see, um, these types of theories, they, they are very good. And uh, for uh, Gauss-Bonnet, we have studied black holes, wormholes, party-like solutions, obtained ultra-compact objects, um, echoes, light rings. And um, yeah, the, <clears throat> the program should now be uh, repeat for a cosmologically well motivated theory <clears throat> where the scalar field just vanishes uh, naturally. Uh, okay, I guess I'm at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Jutta. So uh, now the time for question. Any question? We still have uh, thank you yeah. for giving an uh, interesting talk with uh, a nice uh, introduction. So, um, uh, just so you know, the, it's basically uh, related to the uh, uh, new Ethereum. And as you know, uh, just so you know, the uh, the Nobel, the theorem is, could be constructed under the, some assumptions. So, uh, Bekenstein's assumptions, uh, at least three, so one is the minimal uh, coupling of the uh, gravity and the scalar, uh, just uh, Einstein's scalar theory. And second is the uh, spherical black hole. And third is the energy density uh, uh, should be the non-negative in everywhere. But if, when we couple the uh, curvature and the scalar field, then at least two of three assumptions are violated, as you know. The first thing is that the non-minimally coupled theory, and second one is solution has the uh, could be could have have some negative region at least locally. Uh, so these things, the the hairy black holes nowadays popular. My question is, could you explain if you know who uh, is uh, trying to construct the extended? Uh, Nobel no Hoyer theorem, including the Dilatonic Einstein Gauss theory. Yeah, all are uh, starting on the something violation or a new solution. But could you explain if you know the, who is uh, trying to construct the extended no Hoyer theorem, including this uh, uh, non minimally coupled theory? Could, could you? Uh, yeah. <coughs> Um, I don't know a bit. Uh, I, I don't uh, quite understand. I would like to have a, a no here theorem be for this type of uh, theories. I mean, the, the interesting point is just that you do have uh, the hairs so that uh, when you go to non minimal couplings, uh, couple, for instance, as here in this. Uh, uh, these examples uh, coupled to the um, <coughs> gauss uh, that you do violate uh, the, I mean, the, the no hair theorem is just not a, a theorem for this uh, type of uh, theories. So you, you violate uh, the energy conditions. And in that case, you can have um, uh, the scalar hair, you can have wormholes, you can have the, Funny object. I but <clears throat> I don't know of anybody uh, who is trying to make some general formal um, analysis when you might have no hair theorems uh, for uh, 
modified generalized theories of gravity. Uh, typically, uh, what I see is that um, uh, it doesn't have to be metric theories. It can also be torsion theories uh, uh, or um, whatever um, that people are interested in. Yeah, when, when do you get here? So when do we differ from uh, general relativity? Excuse me, uh, I have questions. So for the Dilatonic coupling case, it is known that the Dilaton charge is the secondary charge for, but if we consider general couplings for pi square coupling, something other couplings, then the, if we calculate the scalar charge, then they are also secondary charge or it's a primary charge. I um, mean, it's a, a secondary charge. Um, it's it's um, just to define from the boundary conditions of the scalar field, let's say somewhere where we make some expansion, uh, let's say like here, <clears throat> then you see you have uh, such a piece, and then you identify the scope coefficient. Uh, but we, we don't have some, <clears throat> some extra conservation law um, for that type of uh, charge. Okay. Uh, Professor Muin Park, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question about one more. So you showed uh, some smooth wormhole uh, without singularity at the throat. Uh, so, so, so my question is that is that I mean that before your work, is there any I mean uh, construction of that kind of wormhole before your wormhole? Um, no, I, I'm sorry, I did not understand. It wasn't right. So <laughs> loud for me. Yeah, so you uh, construct wormhole without, uh, I mean, exotic matter at the throat because mm -hmm. your metric at the throat is uh, smooth. There is no singularity. We, we don't need um, exotic matter. Um, we uh, violate uh, the energy conditions just gravitationally. So it, it's this... Uh, non-minimal coupling that we have, the, the gauss bonnet piece uh, with the scalar coupling yeah. uh, gives us um, uh, this uh, <clears throat> nice road for which we don't need uh, any exotic matter. Right. Um, that, that we consider the, the throat uh, in particular. Um, <clears throat> so we here, we have a, a very nice throat um, without any anything that we have to do right. uh, here in the equator as well. The, the point is that we ah, we do something at the throat or at the equator only uh, to get rid of this singularity that would arise somewhere in the second uh, universe. Right. Uh, and unless we have that special type of solutions to, uh, that uh, correspond to the party uh, solutions. So in that case, uh, we uh, write down the junction conditions. And for the junction conditions, uh, then um, we have some source terms, uh, just because not uh, when we just reflect, not all the functions are uh, yeah, uh, differentiable. Uh, at uh, the throat or at the equator anymore. So we write on the junction conditions and then this is uh, for us uh, sufficient to use ordinary matter to uh, satisfy these junction conditions there. Of course, we can also put, if you like, uh, some uh, exotic matter, but, but this is just uh, for the reflection. But if we don't, want uh, a reflection symmetric wormhole, then we run somewhere in the second uh, universe into the singularity. But here we don't need anything at the throat. So at this throat, everything is uh, differentiable. Okay. 
Right. So my question is, I think this construction is not the same as the usual construction of wormhole. So to my question is, is there any, in, I mean, this kind of a, a construction was known before your work or you consider first this construction? Um, when we uh, did the very first uh, type of uh, these warm hours um, that was in 11 together mm -hmm. with Utah County. Um, we, we did not know or of any uh, other uh -huh. of such uh, warm hours. Um, uh, we, we tried to look, but uh, yeah, so far we, we still are not aware um, of mm -hmm. similar constructions. But of course, uh, yeah, warm hours um, are mostly uh, yeah, very often also constructed and um, differently often analytically and but, but this is also a kind of very uh, involved uh, theory. Gosponet gives very lengthy uh, uh, terms in the equation of motion as you might know. So um, yeah, it, it might be more difficult uh, but at the time we, we did it, we were not aware of uh, the, yeah. any yeah. similar uh, Yeah, I think because, I mean, the, I mean actually we uh, had a similar construction earlier and then we named this kind of a uh, uh, warm -out as kind of special lane and so we called it the natural warm -out because it for um, uh, exotic, uh, I mean, the meta is not needed. So, um, okay, I see. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for this comment. Uh, would, would it be possible that you send me a reference? Uh, yeah, yeah, you? I will, yeah, yeah, I will send. I actually, I sent uh, this reference to you. I mean, you're I mean, the courses, but I, I, I don't know I mean, that there was a response or not. Okay, anyway, I will send the reference to you. Yeah, I will certainly look at that. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry if we... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> missed uh, some work of yours and yeah, uh, so. Um, <clears throat> so we, we should include it in the future. Mm -hmm. Nice thank talk. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a, a, one question. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, oh, you consider the asymptotic flat cases. So, if you consider asymptotic anti distal case, will it be very difficult or something different? Um, we did not um, consider uh, for, for these uh, types of solutions uh, different uh, boundary conditions from asymptotic flatness. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it should be too difficult to construct uh, ADS. Uh, the sitter always, uh, when one has to deal with uh, some horizon somewhere in some sense, but this can also be done. But uh, we just uh, have not yet ventured to, uh, into this uh, kind of direction. Um, <clears throat> but it might be interesting for different uh, reasons. So um, in collaboration with uh, our Korean uh, colleagues, we, we did look at uh, anti the sitter, uh, but then for the very simple case of uh, an Alice Wormhauer. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so motivated uh, from this different type of direction one, one could also um, do anti sitter with those. So I, I see no general problem. Okay, so uh, I think that almost time's up. Um, thank you, Professor Jutta, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank, yeah, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Okay, so the afternoon, the last session of this afternoon.